Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Sports Exchange. My name is Scott Morgan, Roth, the Motor City Mad Mouth, ready for round two with Scott Kornberg. The Scots are square for the second time in a row, Scott. Here we go. Yeah, thank you for having me on again. Thanks for being on. Well, I'll tell you what, yesterday we talked about the Marlins, and we talked about the Jumbo Shrimp, but for a lot of you folks out there that want to know about the history of baseball here in Jacksonville, we're going to give them a pretty good dose of it, aren't we, Scott? I, ho I hope so. That's the goal. All right. Well, we're going to go. I'm going to mention a bunch of names here. So we're going to play the name association game. And folks, let me tell you, if you don't know who these guys are, then apparently you're not a baseball fan. So uh, we'll use the appropriate terminology called leading off. OK, I like it. All right. It's only folks. It's baseball. We have to use those interchangeable terms. We'll have plenty more before it's all said and done. Is it Henry Aaron? Yeah, he played here in Jacksonville in 1953. Everybody knows Henry Aaron, the, the best home run hitter arguably of all time. And uh, he actually, you know, wasn't just an incredible uh, player in the major leagues, but he was kind of a Jackie Robinson here. In the minor leagues, he integrated along with a couple other teammates, the South Atlantic League and the 1953 Jacksonville Braves. So uh, there's a lot of really good players here. He might be the very best one. Okay, well, it's funny how you talk about Henry Aaron, the Jacksonville Braves. Once upon a time, he played for the Milwaukee Braves uh, way back in the day when they played over at County Stadium. So I didn't realize that there was a Jacksonville Braves connection now with the already Milwaukee Braves. Oh, my goodness. Here we go. We're just getting started. Okay. Tom Seaver, unfortunately, uh, he passed away a, few, a couple of years ago. But Tom Seaver, Tom, terrific. Talk, talk to me about him. Yeah, uh, that was in the in the 60s, so a little bit more than a decade later. Uh, so Henry Aaron played here when Jacksonville had an A-ball team in the 50s, and then uh, Jacksonville became a Triple A team in 1962, and eventually the Mets moved their Triple A team here, and those 69 Mets were known for a lot of really good players, a lot of really good pitching. Tom Seaver is one of those guys who came through Jacksonville uh, on his way to to Flushing Queens. So. Um, you know, I think if you had Henry Aaron as your as your best player, maybe Tom Seaver is your best pitcher. That's a pretty good combination for any kind of franchise in, in you know its historic archives. Well, let's go ahead and segue. You want to talk about the Mets? What about Nolan Ryan? All the guy did was throw no hitters that were, by the way, legitimate. Okay, not the no hitters of the modern era. Okay, where they happen every other day. Nolan Ryan threw a lot of them, but Nolan Ryan, you know, what can I say? Yeah, he threw seven of them. So. Right. Uh, and he was a Jacksonville son, so you know it kind of goes into that, that vein. Those late '60s, you had Seaver here, you had Nolan Ryan, albeit for just three games, but he was still a Jacksonville son. Um, and then you also had Jerry Kuzman, who's not a Hall of Famer, but a really good pitcher, and some of those other guys. So uh, yeah, you're starting to build a pretty good staff with Seaver and Ryan, and, and obviously some more names to come, I'm sure. Jerry Kuzman, I'll tell you what, for all you New York Mets fans out, this is the broadcast for you. We're talking Mets baseball here. Jerry Kuzman, great. Glad you brought him up. Clayton Kershaw. Yeah, so, you know, obviously not a Hall of Famer quite yet, probably a few years away from that, but um, that's probably the best modern era pitcher to ever come through Jacksonville. Uh, I say modern era is maybe past like the 70s, but or maybe past the 90s. But, uh, I mean, just a remarkable player, amazing work ethic. That was when Jacksonville was a Dodgers affiliate. So, you know, he came up, and it was a double-A team, and uh, I believe had an ERA of around two, maybe just a little bit below. And the Dodgers knew this kid was pretty darn good, and he did that in double-A, uh, and they were like, we've got no choice but to call him up. So uh, the rest is history. He's had an amazing career in the major leagues and uh, another one of those really good pitchers to come through Jacksonville. So, all right, let's talk about that for a moment. Okay, Scott, you say the Jacksonville Jumbo Shrimp were a Los Angeles Dodgers affiliate. We're going to want to talk about Interstate 10 a long way. This is as far away as you go <laughs> from L.A. all the way to Jacksonville. Well, let's talk about the dynamics of uh, the Dodgers having a double-A affiliate here in Jacksonville now that you brought it up. Yeah, so um, that was uh, the early to, to mid-2000s, and... Uh, kind of a, a maybe forgotten era because people think Jacksonville baseball they probably think the Marlins or maybe they think those historic Mets teams like you were saying but uh, there's a lot of really good players who played here with the Dodgers like a, like Clayton Kershaw obviously probably is the headliner but Dave Roberts would be a guy who was a good player coming up through the minor leagues with Jacksonville and uh, those Dodgers teams are really interesting they um, had a lot of like very star crossed players in the major leagues but you're right really, really far from Los Angeles. So 
Clayton Kershaw is flying all the way from Northeast Florida all the way out to LA. And so, you know, I think come 2009, maybe made sense for the, the demographics to take over. So the Dodgers have been a little bit closer to LA with their triple, uh, double A team, excuse me. And um, obviously the, the Marlins and, and Jacksonville Suns at the time, now Jumbo Schiff are much, much closer. Well, it's funny how you talk about once upon a time, folks, the Dodgers did train over at Dodger Town out in Vero Beach mm -hmm. when they were the Brooklyn Dodgers. And of course, they ended up moving to Glendale. So naturally, geographically, it makes more sense going out west. So, But it is amazing, folks, uh, to realize that the Los Angeles Dodgers were connected to Jacksonville and Beach. So you can talk about learning some. One thing we always expect when we do these types of broadcasts is you're going to definitely learn an awful lot. And we encourage you to go ahead and listen to it one or two times. But if you think you're going to get it all in the first shot, then you're, then you're better than I could ever imagine. So we'll go ahead and talk about Randy Johnson. There's another fireballer. We got a lot of strikeouts on yeah, this list, don't we? We do. It's a pretty good team. So um, remember the 1987 Jacksonville Expo. So that's probably one of the few minor league baseball teams in history that have two Hall of Famers on it between him and Larry Walker. So, um, you know, it was interesting. Randy Johnson at the time, he wasn't like probably people remember in which he had control when he was in Jacksonville. It was, it was a lot of walks, a lot of wild pitches. This was really big for his career to try to figure out maybe more of a simplified lineup and try to put some of that talent together, together put those pieces together uh, to become the Randy Johnson that we all kind of learned about, uh, the one from the Seattle Mariners days. But he was a, an Expos farmhand. Obviously, they traded a lot of guys. He was one of them and uh, worked out for him in Seattle and kind of started here in Jacksonville to, to put things together. Well, it's funny how you talk about Larry Walker, Randy Johnson, and that 1994 Montreal Expo scene that really should have won it all, but the 1994 strike killed Montreal and Major League Baseball. My longtime mentor, Ernie Harwell, and I once talked about the subject that if it weren't for the 1994 strike, there would still be Major League Baseball and Montreal. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Do you believe that as well? Um, it's hard for me to say. I was only three at the time, so I don't remember uh, really much of anything. I remember the Expos as a kid, but to me, that's a, that's a thing that's probably before my baseball memory. So we'll see what happens. Montreal is a team that, a city that's kind of build, bidding for teams in the future. And um, I, I wish that they would have had a chance to try to win the championship there. They're a great team on paper. By all means. All right, well, let's go back to our list. It's a great list here. Phil Negro. Yeah, knuckleballer, um, and and his brother played uh, obviously with the Braves as well. But you kind of stepping back a little bit into time, and, and that was the Braves era uh, of Jacksonville. So the '50s, those A ball teams, and uh, I mean a great story guy who obviously his career took decades, and and a guy who I think had uh, at least one win in four different decades, if I'm not mistaken. Part of that's the longevity of the knuckleball. So he was a really tremendous pitcher. And if he's your number five starter or your number four starter, you're doing pretty darn good there in your rotation. And the Negro, by the way, that you're referring to is Joe Negro. I know all too well. He played mm -hmm. with the Detroit Tigers. And you had two Negroes that were certainly knuckleball pitchers. He had knuckleball. I've always thought it was a dying art, but you had to have a certain catcher to catch that thing. Otherwise, it's going to run circles all over you. But nevertheless, Phil Negro, unquestionably one of the best pitchers that ever uh, play for sure yeah and and there's actually a, a knuckleballer who just debuted in the major leagues this week so hopefully not a dying art that's mickey janice with baltimore so we hope there's more knuckleballers to come because i think it's a really fun thing about baseball you're talking about these guys are before your time well, hoy william <laughs> hoy wilhelm is definitely before your time yeah he is uh, another you know jacksonville hall of famer is the only jacksonville relief pitcher hall of famer so um, you know, I think the, the game is changing now to more multi-inning relievers, and that's kind of what he was from what I gather in his career. Um, it didn't really work for him as a starter, but that was the, the beauty of it is that he figured it out out of the bullpen. And he maybe, you know, alongside with like Tony La Russa with those A's teams and whatnot, you know, obviously different eras, but did pave the way for the bullpen dominated game that we see today. Okay, let's talk about the Jacksonville Redcaps. I'd like a little history lesson on that. So Jacksonville baseball uh, dates back to the 1800s, and uh, there was a Negro Leagues team in the 1800s here in Jacksonville, and they played on and off into the early 1900s. Um, the Redcaps were, were the team from, that's probably the most famous of those, from the 1930s and early 40s. And uh, they were known as the Redcaps, obviously, because they wore red caps, but they worked uh, train station 
and wore red caps as part of their job to kind of lug baggage around and stuff like that. And uh, so they, they were a team that, that worked together, obviously got to play together old, uh, over at J.P. Small uh, Field, which is maybe about a 10 or 15 minute drive from here. And that's one of five Negro League stadiums um, literally left in the entire country. All the other ones have been torn down. So, um, you know, we take that really, really, really seriously, that, that amazing history we've got with the Negro Leagues and the fact that we've got one of five Negro League stadiums left in the entire country is a, a treasure that we are really lucky to have here in Jacksonville. Yeah, why don't you re mention that name of the stadium again? We'll uh, get by there and check it out sometime. J.P. Small, um, just about 10 or 15 minutes away. It's in the Springfield section of Jacksonville, so a, a pretty historic area and uh, certainly a really, really cool place if you just even drive around the outside. A bunch of brick, uh, kind of like an old-time baseball stadium. It's very small, but you kind of get a sense of, of what they were doing, you know, during that time, the 30s and the 40s. It kind of does bring you back even outside of it. Well, you got nothing like a history lesson. Okay, what, and of course, Jacksonville Suns, obviously, is a team that a lot of people are associated with. We're going to get to some of the teams in a moment about that play for the Suns, but let's, why don't you give our l watchers and listeners an overview of the Jacksonville Suns? Sure, so uh, Jacksonville Suns came in in 1962 and they were a AAA affiliate at the time. So Jacksonville Suns were a AAA team from 1962 to uh, 1968. The team moved to Norfolk, so there was no baseball in Jacksonville in 1969. And then when Jacksonville got a team again, it was 1970, and they were the Jacksonville Suns once more. So they were the Suns uh, mostly from 1970 to 20, uh, 2017, became the, the Jumbo Shrimp, obviously, in 2017. And then uh, there was a period where they were the, the Jackspos, the Jacksonville Expos, those teams we were talking about earlier. Right, uh, right, right. Okay, now let's reference back to a few Mariners as well. Ken Griffey Sr., Ken Griffey Jr., Alex Rodriguez roamed uh, the land of I-10. Yeah, well, as your excellent uh, videographer Candy had told us before the game, she or before this, she had said, uh, you know, she was reading a billboard in our press box, and she said, yeah, there was an exhibition game, April 1995. Seattle Mariners were here at the at the time, the uh, affiliate of the of the Jacksonville Suns, and so that was a team with Ken Griffey. That was a team with uh, Ken Griffey Jr. and Ken Griffey Sr. A Rod played for a short stand in Jacksonville as well, 17 games. I say 95, a little bit earlier in the 90s. But either way, um, you know, again, continue that that success. There's some different affiliations here, but I think the the theme is that a lot of different teams put their best players in through Jacksonville, and um, obviously we saw that even during the Mariners days. Very interesting. Well, the one thing about Jacksonville, which I know, and I've been here a lot for the Jaguars, and so now I'm getting my first taste of baseball in the area, is it's a very centrally located area. You think about it, it isn't that far away, obviously, from the Florida teams, but I can imagine you can get to an awful lot of places w within one or two hours as well. So location certainly is a very big situation when you're talking about the Jacksonville professional franchise. Yeah, I, and that's one of the, the, you know, you mentioned the there's a lot of teams in Florida, right? And um, for a time recently, there was Pensacola and Jacksonville in the same league. Obviously, now they're they're double A AA and triple A for the Marlins, but uh, there's a lot happening here. That's why spring training was here for decades and decades, and still is. And this was the first ever spring training site for teams was in Jacksonville, Florida. They've gone more south because of the weather, obviously, but way back in the early 1900s, that first spring training here in Jacksonville. So it makes sense, you know. It's an easy place to get to. The weather is great year round. You don't have to worry about you know guys maybe getting hurt because it's too cold outside right. uh, earlier or late in the year. So it's a really good spot for a minor league baseball team. Do you recall how long a uh, team was here for that first ever spring training? That's a really interesting nugget that a lot of people realize that there was actual spring training here in Jacksonville, Florida before they obviously drifted south. Um, there, there's different reports on when exactly it was. I, I don't remember off the top of my head, right. but um, certainly a really cool fact because who doesn't love spring training, right? It's like right. one of the best things about being a baseball fan. Um, and it started here and obviously morphed from there to other places, but this was the original spot for any baseball team. Very good. Okay, well, let's talk about the Negro Leagues a little bit. It's a, uh, something that's getting a lot more attention, especially nowadays. I know the Negro Leagues Hall of Fame, I believe, is out in Kansas City as well. And, of course, a lot of major cities before they uh, had Negro League teams as well. So talk a little bit about the Negro League's presence in the Jacksonville area, let alone the south where there's always been a lot of segregation. 
Yeah, it's unfortunate that there had to be a Negro Leagues and because uh, these players were good enough to be playing Major League Baseball, which is what just got determined, you know, decades late in the fact that the Negro Leagues were Major League Baseball quality leagues. But I think that speaks to, you know, the first players to come out of the Negro Leagues into Major League Baseball didn't play in Jacksonville, but Jackie Robinson and Larry Doby and Henry Aaron. And you go up and down the list, Willie Mays. I mean, these are not just legendary players. These are like inner, inner circle Hall of Famers. And so the, the concept that these guys couldn't play, it just doesn't add up because once they went into the major leagues, they dominated. So um, the fact that Jacksonville had a team here, uh, the Red Caps in the, in the 30s and 40s in particular were, were kind of their more, more prosperous uh, era. But going back into the 1800s, we don't even know the name of the team. Um, they just were, were known as a Negro Leagues team in Jacksonville. And it just dates back that far. So these are players who are more than good enough to, to not just be in the major leagues, but to excel in the major leagues. And it's a shame that we had to have them, but you know, there's a lot of beauty in the fact that their games um, were a particular brand that maybe were undercover, but the people who saw them really saw maybe the best of America in the fact that these were people who just because of the color of their skin, weren't allowed to play Major League Baseball and said, you know what, we're going to make our own leagues. And they played some of the best baseball in, in the history of, of baseball. So um, the fact that we've got a, a few teams to, to, you know, tip our hat to, no pun intended with the Red Caps, but right. um, is really cool for the city. Yeah, it sure is. All right, let's talk about some of the other teams that have uh, played down here as well. I know the Detroit Tigers play here in the late 1990s. Uh, I remember them quite well, obviously being from that area. Then you said the uh, Mariners were in the early 1990s. Kansas City was here in the 1970s when they obviously went ahead. I covered the Kansas City Royals in the Florida State League back in the 80s. The uh, Montreal Expos have a history in the 80s. And of course, you mentioned the uh, AAA teams with the Cleveland Indians, St. Louis Cardinals, as well as the Mets. So let's talk about the history of all of these particular franchises. Yeah, well, I think with the Mets, the, the pitching that we talked about earlier, those guys certainly comes to mind. Um, you know, they were with Cleveland and St. Louis in the 60s as well. Those first AAA teams are with those two organizations. And, uh, you know, Cleveland had some really good hitters come through here, like Vic D'Avolio, uh, who was an amazing player. Uh, you think about the Royals, they had some really athletic teams in the 70s here in Jacksonville. Guys like Willie Wilson. Um, played here and he was a huge member of the uh, 85 Royals and uh, who won the World Series and Dan Quisenberry came to play in Jacksonville for several years because uh, he just you know they didn't really know what to do with him kind of a funky guy and um, great great pitcher and they just kept putting him back because they didn't think he was going to succeed and he kept doing it and obviously uh, did so in the major leagues as well and those Expos teams the Expos had some of the best minor leagues when they were around, so it makes sense that they would have two Hall of Famers on one team. Mariners had a, a great heyday in the mid to late 90s, early 2000s, so when you're with them in the early 90s, that's when those guys are kind of prospering and, and learning and growing, so you know, A-Rod fits into that. Detroit Tigers, um, some really good players to play here. Gabe Kapler had a great season in Jacksonville. Robert Fick had a really good season in Jacksonville, then you lead way to the Dodgers and, and the Marlins. So it's a really rich baseball history. I think, you know, you were talking about that list earlier. A lot of great players, and, and it makes sense that, you know, when you think about all these organizations that came through here. Did you know that Robert Fick hit the last home run ever at Tiger Stadium? I didn't. That's a great fact. Well, you know what? Give you another fact? Sure. I was at that game when he did it. That's fantastic. I heard it's a great <laughs> park. I wish I could have gone there. Oh, Tiger Stadium was a yeah, but Robert Fick hit the last one. All right, let's talk about Wolfson Park. As we look behind us, you have the where the Jaguars played, TIA, Bank Field, and I know that there was a baseball uh, memorial or a uh, symbol out there, you know what I'm talking about, that big uh, player out there. Mm -hmm. So where did Wolfson Park stand here, to your recollection, based on where we're at, where that stadium, and I know that they have a uh, practice facility uh, by the Jaguars. Yeah, so the, the Jaguars practice facility actually replaced Wolfson, Wolfson Park, so I don't know if people could see the lights. Uh, out beyond our center field, center field wall, but those are the original uh, Wolfson Park lights. And so, um, you know, the, the once you want financial ballpark, obviously moved just a little bit down in the sports complex, but a lot of people reminisce about what a cool old park Wolfson Park was, and, and certainly a great place to see a game built, uh, you know, I think in the, in the 40s or 50s, and uh, obviously a treasured part of Jacksonville's baseball history.
So those lights to the right of us where that burgundy bridge are, that's where Wolfson Park mm -hmm. was. That's correct, yeah. Right over there, and they use the same lights, which I think is really awesome. Yeah, so when we talk about the history of Jacksonville baseball, how would you describe and what do you want people to gain out of this little history lesson that they're getting today from us? Um, you know, I think that, that Jacksonville baseball history is something that, that people maybe don't realize how much treasure there is to it. 11 different Hall of Famers played here um, or coached here. And then um, you've got a bunch of rehabbers, a bunch of great organizations, a jewel of a ballpark that we're in right now, historic park that Wolfson Park was. So to me, you know, I think this, this stacks up amongst any minor league city in America in terms of the players and the quality that, that has come through here. And, and that's not even talking about the Red Caps because we don't know a ton about them right now. We're still trying to find out more information about them. So in any regard, spring training, Red Caps, Negro Leagues, some of the other players to come through here as the Suns or, or the Jumbo Shrimp or the Expos, it's a great, great history we're very, very lucky to have. You know, I've got to ask you this. How did they come up with the Jacksonville Jumbo Shrimp? Well, um, J Jacksonville is the biggest city by landmass in the country. And it's also known for its shrimping industry. So we wanted to have a tie into that. And then Jacksonville, even though it's so spread out, it's known for its small town feel. So you have that Jumbo Shrimp kind of thing ties in the shrimping industry here also ties in that big city the jumbo part and the, the small town field being the shrimp part so that's kind of how we came to it um our fans have really enjoyed it we're really lucky so far and i know jacksonville suns was a name that you guys branded for a lot of years why did they finally get away from the jacksonville suns when you have a traditional name and then you go ahead and come up with this new one i know nowadays Scott, a lot of teams are changing their names due to the Indian situation, but you guys didn't have an Indian situation that caused you to go ahead and make that change. You went from Suns, which is synonymous in the state of Florida, Arizona, and the Sun Belt region, region to the Jumbo Shrimp. But, you know, you took away tradition and then you added something. And I understand it. It's a really clever name for sure. Well, it's a great question. And I think we have new ownership that came in and they wanted to signify that this is going to be a new era of, of baseball here in Jacksonville, that they were going to do things for the city and invest in the community here in Northeast Florida and Duval County. And uh, in doing so, wanted to make sure that um, we, we had our clean mark to be able to try to make those moves. And so, um, you know, I, as part of that, I think uh, our team has really made it more affordable to come to a game in 2021 than it was in 15 years ago. And that's a huge thing. Uh, post pandemic it's uh, we've we've invested millions of hours and, and dollars into our community and that's really important for us too so it was a way for our new ownership group at the time to kind of put a, a line of demarcation in the sand and certainly respect uh, the Jacksonville Suns and, and what they have accomplished but make sure that uh, people realize what the Jumbo Shrimp are all about as well. Well you got a beautiful ballpark so when you talk about developing a brand new park like this what, what ballparks did you try to model this ballpark around? I know that owners like to emulate certain ballparks as well. And this is a beauty. I love it. I love the way your grounds crew keeps the grounds. It's And of course, the festive atmosphere that I noticed yesterday was unbelievable. I was impressed with what I've seen so far. Well, thank you. Um, we've got a great grounds crew. We have excellent fans. This atmosphere is one of the best places to see a minor league baseball game. And uh, I think that, you know, this being built in 2003, they wanted to model this a little, a little bit after Camden Yards. Uh, so you can kind of see that walking on our concourses. There's great sight lines. There's those old style pillars, but they don't really get in the way of people's views. It just kind of takes you back to that different era. Um, so it, it's just an excellent place to watch a game. And none of us were around when this place was built in 2003, but our staff certainly reaps the benefits of it because it's a jewel of a ballpark. So any closing thoughts about what people should know about the history of Jacksonville professional baseball? Uh, no, no, grateful that you had me on again. Uh, hopefully people enjoyed it, learning about it a little bit and, and something that I think is really cool as a baseball fan. All right, well, my name is Scott Morgan Roth, Motor City Man I'm Mouth. Glad to be joined by another Scott, Scott Square, Scott Gordon. Bird, you know, this is our second act here on the Sports Exchange. Uh, planning, you know, we'll look forward to doing another one hopefully down the line. But it's been a great couple of days here up in Northern Florida. As I mentioned on the other broadcast, I'm used to seeing games over with the Jacksonville Jaguars, but this has been such a very enlightening situation being able to cover baseball in a great military town that really supports her professional baseball and what this history lesson that we're getting but the negro leagues in addition to the vast professional it's just something folks every one thing about 
about the great American pastime is every city has a story when it comes to baseball. And thankfully, Scott, I know our objective here these last couple of days is to try to give our fans an opportunity to learn about the Jacksonville history as well. So once again, Scott, thanks for being a guest here on the Sports Exchange. Uh, once again, I'm the Motor City Mad Mouth. This is Scott Square, Scott Kornberg, Scott Morganroth. Here we are in beautiful Jacksonville, Florida. Scott, thanks again for doing this. Appreciate it. And uh, I guarantee the Marlins people down in South Florida are going to have a lot. They'll, they'll get cauliflower ears listening to the stories <laughs> I got to tell these people. Thanks again, well, Scott. Thank you very much. Appreciate, appreciate it, Scott. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you.